I'd like to take this moment now to introduce the person who has kind of made this program happen, despite what she says. Um, Dr. Keisha Farmer-Smith is senior lecturer of, in the College of Urban Planning and Policy Analysis here at UIC, as well as research director at the Morton Group. She received her PhD in Urban Planning and Policy in 2010 with a concentration in gender and women's studies. Dr. Farmer-Smith is a professionally trained social worker, researcher, and community organizer who's passionate about grassroots community sustainability and has partnered with organizations that provide safe, healthy spaces for youth to participate in community and movement building work for over 20 years. Let's welcome Dr. Keisha Farmer-Smith. and I appreciate the warm introduction. It is my honor, it is my honor and my pleasure to say hello to all of you. And it feels like a full circle moment for me because I was a student at what used to be called the Office of Women's Affairs many, many years ago. <laughs> and now it is so beautiful to see this amazing and wonderful space the Women's Leadership and Resource Center. It is my pleasure to introduce our panelists to you, and I'm going to be reading their bios. All of our panelists are personal friends of mine. Some of them are mentees that serve as mentors. Some of them are sorority sisters, and some of them, all of them, are comrades in the urban planning struggle. So uh, when I read your bio, if you don't mind uh, raising your hand a little, uh, that's cool with me, I appreciate it. Alicia Garcia Flores. Alicia is currently the Director of Evaluation and Data in, at Enlace Chicago, a nonprofit organization serving Little Village neighborhood in Chicago. Enlace partners with a predominantly Latin population to address areas in community health, violence prevention, education, and immigration. Alicia has worked in Chicago communities for over 18 years as the advocate and also as the education director at Enlace. She specializes in internal evaluation and data management. Um, as a month alum, Ms. Garcia Flores has used, has used her training to approach evaluation through the lens of community development, building sustainable organizational structures and supports for continuous learning and quality improvement efforts, and developing participatory approaches using culturally responsive evaluation. She's a dear friend, and thank you for sitting on this panel, Alicia. The next person I want to introduce you to is right next to Alicia is Ann Barnes. Ann Barnes worked for 15 years in the graphic arts field and became a community organizer in the early 1990s, working predominantly on housing issues, particularly in areas impacted by gentrification. Ms. Barnes served as an executive director of the Jane Addams Senior Caucus, where she developed and implemented a successful campaign for the Ruth Sherman House, advocating for new construction and affordable housing on the North Lakefront for very low uh, income elders. Ms. Barnes also was lead organizer on several projects for the Metropolitan Tenants Organization. After 10 years in organizing, talk about practice coming first and then the theory coming after. After 10 years in organizing, Anne earned her MUP degree and remained a staff right here at UIC, where she worked first at the Center for Research on Health and Aging, then in urban planning and policy where she supported day-to-day -day operations, as well as curriculum, accreditation, study abroad, and whatever else needed to do. Cecile, Cecile Danello is a community organizer and urban planner 
with over 20 years in experience in community development and advocacy, inclusive and participatory advocacy work. Y'all, I, I use Team Inglewood's videos in many of my classes. I told her we owe her consulting dollars. <laughs> she has been working to improve the quality of life of low-income Black and Brown individuals through policy, direct action, organizing, and planning. She has created and supports initiatives in retail development, community infrastructure, youth and workforce development, and educational planning. Ms. DeMello serves as the executive director of Team Inglewood, a community-based organization focused on safety to services, services to special needs populations, and the promotion of healthy lifestyles for all residents in the Inglewood community. Next, we have the amazing and phenomenal Yazzie. Yaz Tadros <laughs> is an Arab, Black, Egyptian, trans woman, organizer, poet, and cultural worker. She holds a bachelor's degree in women and gender studies from Sonoma State University and a master's degree in urban planning and policy from UIC. Her interest includes exploring how do we envision cities where working class communities own their labor and the community's resources. Yasmin specializes in building sustainability within communities of identity. Before working at UIC's Gender and Women's Studies, she helped organize space through the Brave Space Alliance. And she loves walking, working out, trying new food spots in the city, and sharing memories with friends. Last but not least, it is my pleasure to introduce my friend and sorority sister, Marlita White. Marlita is the director of the Office of Violence at the Chicago Department of Public Health, which has a portfolio of violence prevention, intervention, and response initiatives. In addition to serving as a child and family therapist and a crisis responder, Ms. White has served on many strategic planning and practice and, and practice planning processes. She has also worked with the health departments and the city's trauma-informed transformation teams. She is a longtime member of the Illinois Childhood Trauma Coalition, the Illinois Adverse Childhood Experience Response Collaborative, and has National Youth Forum on Youth Violence Prevention in Illinois' Children's Mental Health Partnership. She believes her work aligns with a powerful mission to dismantle the systemic burdens of trauma, marginalization, and inequity on vulnerable individuals, families, and communities. And um, a simple guest, can we welcome all five of our family? Thank you so much for attending all five of you. I'm going to ask you the first question of our time together. And then we have um, some students of urban planning that are also going to be asking you some questions. For your first question, can each of you please tell the audience just a little bit more about yourself? Can you tell us how you came to be interested in urban planning or urban policy issues? Thank you. You're going to have Colin. Okay. Thank you, Marlon. So, um, for me, um, when I was exploring advanced uh, the study opportunities, I really stumbled on urban planning. So, I didn't know that urban planning was a thing. Um, and in my background as a social worker, so, of course, I had some sociology courses and, and other kinds of courses that I thought prepared me for the kind of convergence of thought that I found in urban planning. I thought I was well situated in that kind of a study, although I'm probably an example of uh, a failed attempt at a PhD. I just had to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, nevertheless, um, I found that being able to learn more about the skills of a researcher 
uh, survey design, um, uh, engagement of the, the potential respondents and audiences, how to ask and compassionate questions, mm -hmm. understanding and appreciating different types of data, all of those kinds of um, opportunities to learn and enhance those kinds of skills and also reading and learning more about the ways that institutions and the infrastructure drive so much of the ways that we interact with one another, even be, before we get to be individuals um, or that there is competition um, against those kind of seemingly intractable, um, that infrastructure in those spaces. I just felt like those conversations and the people who are drawn to that really worked well with my research or, or my background as a social worker and a therapist and my interest in, in mental health and, and, and wellness and, and be active. Mm -hmm. That was a long answer. I'm not that. That's a long answer. Okay. Powerful answer. Thank you. Thank you. Can I interject for one second? I just want to ask our panelists if you wouldn't mind just trying to speak as loudly as you can. You're coming through, but it just, if you could speak a little bit more loudly, that would help greatly for our Zoom uh, audience here today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I'm Andy Lerner. My name's Cecile. Um, I'm born and raised on the South side of Chicago. Preacher's kid, that's why I can't project. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, I originally thought I was going to be a journalist and went to Temple University to get my undergrad. And I was, was always asking questions on why I saw such distinct differences in navigating Chicago and also being from a family that was struggling economically, but was with me, right? So um, I got introduced to organizing and activism while I was in college. And I was like, yeah, see, journalism just asks the questions and organizing asks the questions and helps to build the answers. I would prefer to do that, even though I love journalism. Um, I was doing community organizing and statewide work in Illinois, but then really um, honed in at Blocks Together in West Hunter Park on the west side of Chicago, there for 13 years, and um, saw where urban planning actually makes big mistakes in communities of color here in Chicago in particular and how they make lasting decisions on how you can do powerful economic development. So um, I actually came here to be a better organizer when I joined as a master's and I was planning to be here. Um, and it helped me to understand and be better prepared to help um, with our organizing campaigns. And instead of the language of urban planning being used against the campaigns that we were working on, which was anti-school closure work, um, economic development financing tools, investment, um, all the way to retail development. And I was able to use what I learned here to actually be able to advocate better and actually fight against those narratives um, that continue to uh, disinvest and depopulate. Hey, y'all. So, um, so I'm to go like um, off what you said, I'm uh, Yazzie. Um, so she, her pronouns. And yeah, so how, uh, a little bit about me and why I chose urban studies and urban planning as one of my, as like, um, my, as like a graduate path and career is, uh, prior to that, I was a, a women's and gender studies major. And like with that, I did a lot of cultural planning and programming with around specifically around LGBTQ plus, um, communities and issues on college campuses, but also in different parts of the Bay Area as well. And um, specifically, one of the things that in doing that kind of organizing was like looking at how homelessness kind of impacts that because like homelessness is very rampant in the Bay. In the Bay. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, and I was really curious and like looking at specifically how like the gentrification of LGBTQ plus spaces in urban um, in urban settings impact the ways um, communities access these spaces or the lack of spaces. And I was wanting to look at um, graduate programs that kind of like because look at graduate programs because with um, women's and gender studies you learn about how systems of power operate to harm marginalized communities. And I wanted to see how. I could apply like theory into practice. And 
And in looking at urban planning, like I thought that would be a really great field for me to apply like feminist and queer methodologies to um, urban planning. And yeah, and like I wanted to do urban planning to both like um, inform and help better create the ways in which I um, create like cultural programming and spaces for LGBTQ plus uh, communities, but also help encourage and rate, continue to do consciousness raising within communities so that they can help also create um, uh, spaces themselves so that spaces um, within urban sense can uh, further um, be increased. Okay, so um, um, I originally am from Michigan and when I moved here in 2003, I was an undergrad and I worked at, um, or sorry, I studied at the Chicago Center, which is in Hyde Park, the Chicago Center for Urban Life and Culture. And I did an internship in North Lawndale. And through that center, um, we learned about urban development. We learned about different communities in Chicago. And I love Chicago. So I made my way here two years later. I almost tried to transfer, but I'm not losing credits. That was mine. I was about to lose credits. But I kind of have a similar story um, to Arlita of, of I didn't know what urban planning was. I had not been exposed to that. Um, so when I was looking to move here, I, I wanted to continue my education, but I wanted it to do something similar to my undergrad. I had studied sociology and business management. Um, I've been in youth development since I was a youth, one of those stories. So I, want, I have worked with youth that are marginalized youth, and I wanted to learn how to better um, work in the Chicago communities through the lens of urban planning. So I found this program and I loved it. And I found people like Keisha, who was my mentor. Um, but I think for me, it was learning about how built environment and how um, inequities come to be, how policies affect that, um, especially for people of color. Um, I worked in North Lawndale and then South Lawndale. So I got to see that dynamic as well as a young 22 year old and um, have been, and, and when I came to Chicago, I started getting involved in organizing and advocacy work and um, schools, the school system and out of school time programs. So I got to work in charter schools and see that dynamic between charter and public. So that uh, just deepened my interest in urban planning. Um, hi, I'm Anne and um, I, I kind of, backed into urban planning at the end of um, doing a lot of other things. But I've always had a real interest in cities. I'm an unapologetic baby boomer. Um, I spent the first eight years of my life in a brand new subdivision. Um, there were no lawns when we moved in. It was very sterile. The men all got in the cars and drove away and the women stayed home. And my mother told me once that she used to not see anybody but the milkman and the mailman, sometimes for days at a time. Um, when I was about eight, we moved to, I was born in, in the District of Columbia. When I was about eight, we moved to a walkable neighborhood right across the river from the district. And I started going, um, a, friend of, a friend of mine, our mothers were friends, and we would, um, we would take the bus from where we lived, and we would meet at the Woolworths at 11th and G Street in downtown Washington. Um, and then we would either go back to her house or to my house and have a, a, a sleepover. And then our mothers would get together and, and pick us up. And this was um, at the height of the civil rights movement. And Woolworths is a thing of the past, but the Woolworths lunch counters were um, a real place of, of um, severe contest during the civil rights movement. And so from a very early age, I had this view on um, cities as contested space and a place where organized people could really challenge things to change and to change for the better. Um, I spent my, when I was in junior high school, we moved to New York City and because we lived more than a mile from the school, um, I got a, a transit pass. And so I could go anywhere in the city I wanted. And I just wandered the city throughout junior high school and high school. Um, and then I spent a uh, bouncing back and forth between um, sort of small town Midwest and New York. And at 22, I moved to Chicago with $125 in my pocket and 
Um, it was a very different city, and I had always been involved in activism, and so I became involved in um, all sorts of things. And at a certain point, I sort of left. I had, I had never taken any social sciences in, when I was in college. I, it was all literature and fine arts. Um, but at a certain point, I sort of, I, I, I moved into organizing full time. And it was really, um, really rewarding, really challenging, really exhausting. Um, and at a certain point, because of some health issues, I needed to step back from that work full time. And so a friend who had gotten his MUP degree at um, an advanced age and was working at UIC um, suggested that I get my MUP degree. And so I did, and um, uh, it helped me sort of put, create a lot of context for a lot of things I had done that I had done successfully just kind of by instinct, um, but to understand how they fit into a bigger picture. And I continue to be really active. We're having right now in my neighborhood, we successfully are having some um, housing built for Native American community. That was a huge fight in my neighborhood. And I was, uh, you know, took a role on uh, community support for that, even though I am retired. And I probably will continue to do that, you know, as long as I'm able, so. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, now we're going to have some questions shared by uh, some of the suits who partnered with uh, the Women's Leadership and Resource Center and Urban Planning and Policy. And special thanks to any suits that are in the room. Um, can we have our first question? And SOUP stands for Society of Urban Undergraduate Planners. Correct? Yes. All right. <laughs> so our first question is, why is it important to have diverse women and non-binary people working for the planning? I'll take a stab at that. So one of my mentors, a former boss of mine, um, and uh, just an all around wonderful woman, um, is a Native American woman. She's the nominee. And thank you for your really meaningful land acknowledgement. They're oftentimes very sort of pro forma, but um, and when she, when I told her I was going to get my master's degree, she just laughed and, um, and she said, oh, good, you're going to learn the language of the enemy. <laughs> and I thought to my, you know, it, it really made me think. And I thought, um, it, it is important to, I mean, planners are often the enemy in communities. And, you know, I, when I was working as an organizer, the planners were oftentimes on the other side of the table and didn't want to listen to you. You had to force them into meetings and whatnot. And so being able to, as you know, um, I think it was Cecile who said, being able to, you know, to talk their language um, and counter their arguments. And that only happens when you bring in people who have a diversity of background and um, a diversity of, uh, of perspective. For me, um, working in social services, um, you know, we're a female dominated kind of area, but I think that's important because we work with a lot of families and communities and women. And um, I think that we still encounter such inequities and in patriarchal systems that we have, we need women in this area um, to recognize biases and, and fight for um, things that women still encounter, um, even though we've made progress, there's still a lot of ways to go. So I feel like, you know, in, in urban planning, like evaluation, it is still male dominated as well. Um, but to navigate, you know, issues that we encounter even in, in Little Village, I think it's important to have women that have stories that are similar to community that we, we value, like staff members that um, have those experiences and can relate, but also be vocal and be, you know, fighters in social justice work. Um, so very important. To kind of go um, off of what um, we all mentioned, I think like having more women and non-binary people in planning, both like 
um, both like in terms of like the representation is very important and um, and also like helping kind of reimagining what urban planning could be and like applying different um, methodologies and different theories to kind of reimagine what planning could be to center the most uh, marginalized and um, and like just from my experience in the MUP program having amazing mentors like Keisha and also having great professors like um, Brenda Parker and Kalo, um, who've like taught me like that, like um, both like the histories of inequity, but like also the ways in which like urban planning can be like both like an understanding those systems of person can be transformed to like actually to actually help the most marginalized in the cities and so. Yeah, I think along the lines, um, being able to be a woman in policy conversations and planning conversations also centers the experience of, of women and those who identify as women in our planning and our policy work, uh, which um, I've seen it be ignored. And, you know, everything from how we talk about school-based planning to retail planning to even what drives a community's economy. Um, having women's experience at the center of those conversations and being able to dispel assumptions and some of the data and how it can be misconstrued about the practices of women in communities and in culture is extremely important. And so many times, not only as a woman in the space, but also as a mother in the space, I have to call out when something is being done that's actually going to hurt the women and the mothers of a community. And, um, and, and I'll sit there and I'll be like, well, why do I have to say it? Mm -hmm. And it's usually because I'm the one who's coming from that frame of that lens and that frame of reference. And so having more uh, diversity in those conversations allows for us to slow down the mistakes or those assumptions that we make mm -hmm. and press upon. And not just the barriers, the, the asset mm -hmm. of women in those conversations, mm -hmm. too. I don't know that I have anything different to, to add. I, I, I love all the responses. I, I would say just for me, uh, it makes sense that decisions and, um, that affect people ought to be decisions that people get to weigh in on in those different perspectives. Like why would there be a diverse set of voices for a decision or set of decisions that will impact a diverse set of you know, beneficiaries? good or bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I believe we have some other questions. Uh, what other women or people have inspired you to work on urban planning issues and who did they look up to and who or what inspired them to be planners? Well, for me, um, I have some people in the room that have inspired me as definitely as well. Um, Anne was a, a great mentor when I was a student. Um, Hazel Brown um, in, in, encourage, in encouraging me. Um, of course, Keisha, Janet Smith, Christy Prawl um, is somebody who I think welcomed me into um, you know, it's hard to be in spaces where you're not from that community, right? So I got to work on the quality of life plans with her and learn from her. So I think wherever women, you know, encourage and accept other women is really, really important in the field, but especially in urban planning. Um, I think for me, what what encouraged me and, and motivated me was a book by Maria Patillo, Black to Consensus. Mm -hmm. That was something I read um, as I was a student at the Chicago Center, and it kind of opened my eyes. As she's a current professor at North, uh, Northwestern, um, that encouraged me to look deeper into the work that I was doing in the community and, to, and what an ally and an advocate truly means. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, Janet Smith was a huge mentor for me, and I I knew Janet. Um, before I came into the MUP program. And so we had a very long and, and, and rich relationship. Um, you know, I don't think I ever had the conversation with her about um, 
who inspired her to become a planner. I know she really, Norm Krumholtz was a big uh, influence on her. Um, she kind of backed into it in, but much earlier than I did because she came out of the art world and um, she said she had, you know, she had friends when she got her degree in uh, product design from UIUC who got jobs making those transformer toys. Mm -hmm. And they just thought that was the coolest thing ever. And she just thought, and, and then, you know, from there she worked on a homeless survey and then she was hooked. And um, Raffaella Nanetti, who's a retired faculty and who really taught me that um, in any given era, there is kind of a dominant theory of planning that drives how planners operate. And I had never thought of it that way, that it, and, it, and that it's connected to all sorts of other things. It's connected to business development. It's connected to, I mean, it, it's not just planning is not an isolated thing, but that you can look at theory that way. Pat Wright, who gave me a job that allowed me to go to graduate school, my former boss, um, Pam Silas, but also outside of it, people I've never met, people like um, Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote a book called um, The Warmth of Many Suns, which details the Great Migration and helped me really understand things that I saw as a child. Um, and I can't wait to read her book next. Um, so, uh, So I'll say for me, I don't know how I'm doing projecting. I, I <laughs> <laughs> and I and I'm to moment. <laughs> um, but for me, because I came from social work, I was initially influenced by people outside of urban planning um, and looked toward urban planning, but that was in my mostly because I was struggling with why does it work that way? Mm -hmm. and then learn that it was built environment. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say the first person, um, first uh, woman that I read that I it jumped off the page was Jane Jacobs. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, and I don't remember people like that. I'm, you know, I'll just, oh, that was information, but I don't attach it to people. But I've always remembered um, that work because it was, the first time I started, I was reading of someone who was really talking about the challenge of space and how space can be manipulated in ways. And it was just from a voice of, it doesn't have to be that way. So it was just kind of at the right time for work kind of uh, dropped into my brain. So, Yeah, I would agree. Uh, the eyes on the street kind of planning model is really important to the work we do in Inglewood or you know, hot spots and using environmental design to leverage both infrastructure investments for the community as well as create safe spaces um, and beautiful safe spaces yeah. too, which is important in our work. Um, I also want to bring up, up um, younger people who inspire me as well. So some of the youth that are in our civic engagement program, some of the youth that I worked with at Blocks Together who are doing this work, are challenging my thinking around the work. Um, they have so much more fluidity about how they approach the work and even some of their own urban design work that they've done in our, in our community work has blown me away and has challenged some of my assumptions about how black and brown youth navigate Chicago, navigate Inglewood. And uh, so I am excited about younger folks too coming into space and all of the access to information and, the social moments that they have witnessed and how they are definitely taking the mantle to another level. And so I'm a student of them as well. Like the mold of that. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of people, um, you know, like I, I mean, like the first person who comes to mind is um, uh, Keisha, who was one of my mentors um, in the program. Uh, I like also similarly. I come like. Coming from like women's and gender studies, like you have read people like Bell Hooks, Audre yeah. Lorde, Octavia Butler, and different like authors, feminist, uh, black feminist authors who aren't necessarily coming from the planning space, but like have looked at um, like Bell Hooks wrote about like wrote an entire chapter on how Appalachia was intentionally designed, like the intentionally was designed. And 
and I came like from that and uh so I looked at urban planning from this sort of like oh like it is like this oppressor like it is like the oppressor's language and um it was like folks like Keisha who actually taught me how like um through different theoretical uh frameworks of community development and practice like how like urban planning can be used as um, a tool for the oppressed to transform their communities. And another like aspect was actually looking at um, when I did uh, an independent study in the MUP program with Brenda, um, and I looked a lot around like queer and feminist geography. And though not like, also like planning adjacent, but looking at like space um, and urban space through different um, frameworks of like how do we look at geography through the lens of the urban geography through the lens of the oppressed? And yeah, and like that allowed me to sort of rethink um, of like that urban planning can be used as a tool of um, for working class communities and the intersections within that to like transform um, their communities to design a city that is for them. Powerful responses. I believe we have another question from the suits. <laughs> How has being a woman or a non-binary person in planning changed in the last 50 years since Kappa UPP has been established? I probably have the longest history in Kappa <laughs> because I started, <laughs> I started when I was an undergrad at UIC. I actually um, um, was hired through a work study program to do some brochures for the Voorhees Center. That's where I first huh. started interacting with Cup, and that would have been in like the late 1980s. And so, I mean, I knew that Cup had always been a fairly welcoming place. I mean, Pat Wright was one of the first, she was in the first graduating class of MUPS, and she had become head of the Voorhees Center. Um, I think. In general, women have always been welcome, although not, you know, any institution is a reflection of the society it operates in. And so there have been extremely patriarchal um, people operating within Kappa and, um, and some attitudes that, you know, have, um, I think as society has changed and I think as generally, um, um, a you know a pretty open-minded place as society has become more accepting of women in positions of power um, of non-binary people that Kappa has reflected that um, I don't you know there have always been strong very strong women on the faculty um, and that's been a really important part of uh, attracting a student body that's uh, Got a lot of women, so and you know, I think it's just it's it's developed along the same lines as society is developing, and hopefully will continue, even though society may be backsliding a little, a little on that in that regard. I see some similar challenges today, um, but I was I started in fifteen years ago was when I was a, a couple student. Um, I, I feel like when I visited your classes, Keisha, I see a, a bit more diversity and more women. Um, but I mean, I was one of a couple Latino, you know, planners in when I was studying, and I still feel like there we need more representation in this field. Um, in terms of, you know, what I do see though that I'm really encouraged by is more student groups and more connection. Mm -hmm. It feels like to each other and the work and outside of classes and things. And I was a working, you know, student. I was full-time working in a nonprofit and then was like, I need to do part-time to finish this degree. Um, but it was hard to keep engaged and to know all the resources available. So I see in social media, this sh more sharing of resources and um, uplifting each other that I think is really needed in the field. So that's really encouraging too. And so, yeah, within, my context, I um, got my, I started um, 
the MUP degree in 2018 and graduated in 2020. And yeah, like I um, definitely like has like since then I've seen yeah, definitely kind of echoing, like seeing more student groups like kind of pop up and like more like students are like sort of trying to reimagine like and specifically women and non-binary people both going into the planning field, but like also like wanting to see how they can transform the planning field as well. Um, yeah, and like I even like, um, and starting last semester, I co-advised an alum of the Urban Studies program who um, wanted to create, and it's now sitting in the GSC's website of like all gender restrooms, a GIS map of all gender restrooms at UIC, both West, East Campus and in the law school. And so, which I thought was really cool, which I thought was really cool in looking at how do we like be more inclusive of um, non-binary and gender expansive folks like in uh, GIS. And so I thought that was really um, awesome. And yeah, I definitely think that there needs to be more, needs to, there needs to be a much more improvement. I like, I know post-graduation there's been like in trying to get more like direct urban planning jobs, there has been like some, um pushback mm -hmm. and but I have sort of learned that like um my own experiences and what I want to do is urban planning and but yeah I think there's been a lot of improvements but I think um it's still needs yes I for me this question I struggle with it a little bit because I'm trying to receive the question as in what has the last 50 years done to help with the position of women um, because sometimes representation, as we know, doesn't always mean progress. Mm -hmm. And sometimes my worst moments in organizing came from other women being mm -hmm. oppressive with their policy and their community engagement. Um, but I'm not here to like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, but I think we should be always thinking about the question in planning and policy. And, and there's there's similar questions that we have in education work that I had to do a lot of deep diving in and a lot of my career is what is the condition of the of the community that we're planning for? Um, because we have to be asking the questions about women in employment, women in entrepreneurship, women, when are they leaving the city? Why are they coming back to the city? And there I see some positive trends, especially in the work that's been happening across Chicago and in the fierceness of folks of being able to uh, rise up against injustice. But I also see where we still have a long way to go. So for, for me, the question is about who are we planning for, not always who it are the planners. Mm -hmm. Even though we have more luck if the planners are diverse <laughs> and inclusive, we've seen, especially in this city, that doesn't always mean the results are for the perception. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I lost track of what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> been practicing listening more than, than preparing my answer yeah and I feel like there's a little bit of drift so I want to be specific so could you repeat the Absolutely. question for me um how has being a woman or non-binary person been changed over the last 50 years okay right. I got so distracted because I was trying to figure out definitely I was here before the center was here and all of those things I had a different experience as a student here. I was not, as I mentioned, I wasn't successful here. Um, and just, I don't know if it was more about being um, economically unstable and having to work and put more time there, making choices that didn't ultimately support completing the degree. But I think also just not finding a resting place. Mm -hmm. So I think for students, who now have access to those kinds of support that I hear so many people saying, and Keisha, and Keisha, those, I was kind of adrift. Mm -hmm. So I um, I wouldn't want to say that it was um, just the women who were adrift, but I think it was the sense of being so much of the other mm -hmm. that you didn't get connected. There weren't naturally occurring tethers mm -hmm. that kept you here, and nobody missed you. Wrong. So for me, I think it is how do you, especially in a space that, or in a discipline that focuses so much on what community means, mm -hmm. to create community, 
uh, it's not naturally occurring, but it has to spend the time and effort and energy to make sure that it's there. So well stated, so well stated. I'm sorry that I'm not on the panel, but what, what uh, Marlita just shared is so important. And to be honest with you, the Office of Women's Affairs became that community space for me so that I and others could create that space for other PhD and completers. That's exactly what Women's Leadership and Resource Center did, gave me a safe harbor. So I'm just interrupting to ask that. And I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that honest response. And I really appreciate um, the other uh, uh, people at the time, including Dr. Jenny Breyer, who helped to make sure that um, we cultivated a community space. Uh, even if it meant writing together and having someone to take care of children while we were writing. It was powerful. I think we have one more question from our soups. Yeah, uh, I'll ask the uh, uh, personal question just to, uh, that I don't want to read off of like a <laughs> little paper. Yeah. Uh, as a woman of power or as a person of power, uh, what uh, do you think needs to be done to kind of bring the field uh, it just like to be more seen? As we know, the field of urban planning and public policy uh, isn't really known uh, to uh, our communities. Uh, uh, Black and brown communities, uh, because uh, personal experience, uh, when I told uh, people in my community that I was gonna study urban studies, they didn't know what the field was. Uh, so uh, that is my question to you guys. A powerful question. So what tools, what resources are needed to support diverse people in joining this field is what I hear you asking. Yes. Uh, so what I say, thank you. I'm engaged here, um, currently in a, a Pathways Initiative program, which is for evaluators of color in the Chicagoland area. And we've learned a lot through, I've learned a lot through that of what kind of supports, but also the kind of education and the outreach and this, it, you know, is needed for people of color to really be supported, not just in the beginning of it, but to make it a career. And I think that there's, you know, there's such, you think about where you're, you know, a trajectory in your career. And if I get there, am I going to be welcome? Am I going to feel comfortable? And in a lot of spaces, even as a student, when I was a student, um, I went to, it's one of the agencies listed um, on the website I was looking today. And um, it was not welcoming as an intern. It was predominantly white. It was predominantly male. Um, lived experience was not valued, uh, skill building and helping me cultivate that was not really done. So I think with our Pathways program, I think it's really important to have mentorship. It's important to have that community to lean on for others in the field to be open to um, taking the time to, uh, to work with somebody on their needs and their career path. Um, because it's not a welcoming field necessarily um, for folks. So I think the more that we do that and, and also unearth what are your needs and be human centered about it, um, could definitely. I can say, um, as a racquetball player, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that. I think you have to find the people who are willing to be champions and then help those people be out in front and have your time and whether that's in social media or in other, you know, other ways you put them in, in connection or help them access a platform. But if it's only if the only way people get there into the field is because you know, maybe they survive and then they back into it, or maybe they're strong enough to have finished whatever that course is. It's hard to be, I think we have to build systems that are not just for the uniform. Um, because people have so many ideas and contribute in the middle. And the people who, I think the panel represents, you know, people who are, are 
special and gifted and talented and pushed against barriers. Um, but there's probably 20 to 50 people that they were encountering and even I was encountering who could be changing the world but didn't push through and couldn't break through. So I think those kind of, how do you navigate people? How do you throw out those kind of tethers and pull them in and make those conversations that happen in policy spaces, have that with young people and other people who are not even necessarily young, but are just living in community, just living their regular life. They never have access to that dialogue. It's just on TV. It's just an article. And when you can have regular people in conversation and then just help them reword and lift it up. Like this is a policy conversation, but we're having it at the kitchen table. I feel like that kind of, and then say, this is urban planning. You know, this is what mapping can do and this is what research can do. To demystify it, then I think you open a, a highway into the field. I um, have been super appreciative of Keyshawn inviting me to come <laughs> in the classes here, just showing students the ways that you can manifest urban planning through not just an urban planning actual position, but that you can manifest, you know, urban planning through health and wellness. There's always a big conversation about those in grocery stores and where they're located are a lot to do with urban planning and zoning and ordinances. Um and so I, I, even though I'll be like, oh, I can't, I don't feel like I, I will still do it because I just want other people to see that you can use these tools in so many different facets in uh, decision making and programming and organizing work. Uh, and so yeah, I'm always trying to make those connections. I think we need to make them more. I think we need to make them more with academic and the folks who do the work more intimately um, so that people can see the different pathways. Uh, of opportunities that they can grow a larger network, but also a larger career path. The same thing that we're talking about with urban planning is also the same conversations with community organizing. Um, community organizing is seen as a career and all of the facets that community organizing can be included in different types of work areas is sometimes not really discussed because we don't create intentional spaces for the career paths to be discussed with diverse folks. but because we have a conversation about why is this and why is that at the kitchen table. We just don't have the framework uh, of the right. uh, of what that study is, right, mm -hmm. for people. Um, well, not being a person of color, but having worked over the years, and I, I'm thinking, you know, this this conversation is prompting a thought. I, I led a, a project once. When I was working at Metropolitan Tennis Organization, where we had 10 VISTA volunteers, and I took over this project from somebody who had recruited all these um, college educated students to come and work in low income communities and go knocking door to door. This was at a time when evictions were rampant and whatnot. And it was just a disaster. I mean, it was an absolute disaster. And I took over the project and I started talking to the people, and they were invariably women who were taking leadership in these buildings where sometimes the living conditions were horrific. Um, and I talked to my boss at the time and I said, why aren't we recruiting these women? And it, this happened to coincide with, with TANF, if you are old well, to remember TANF, where when, you know, it was three years on public assistance and you're out. And, you know, all, all my college educated list of volunteers were like, you know, just, martyrs to the fact that they had to live on $685 a month, which was the VISTA stipend. But the women who were on public assistance and, and they could get that $685 and it didn't re reduce their tenants. So we did a 180 degree pivot and turned it into a job training. You know, this was an issue that was really close to these women. They had lived it. They knew what the risks were in speaking out against your landlord. And one of the lessons I always took away from organizing, and it's a hard lesson and a lot of organizers never learn it, but anything that has to be done in organizing, you need to ask, your, so often our, our impulse is to do it ourselves. I can do it better. I know how to do that. I can do it. And yet the question that we as organizers need to ask ourselves is, 
What is gained by me doing that? And what is lost by me not letting somebody else do that and providing them the support to do it right and ju not judging them for, you know, I would have done this differently or that differently, but just really um, in a very deep way, recognizing that building, building capacity in people is an ongoing thing. It doesn't happen at an every other Friday training session. It is an ongoing thing that sometimes requires you to step back so that other people can step forward. Yeah, now, um, I really love how you um, framed it in terms of like manifesting growth and planning into different ways. And um, I definitely think like, to kind of go off of that, like how um, in terms of trying to like make, um, make urban planning more inclusive to women and people of color is like both in terms of like language, because oftentimes like women and people of color don't have the language around like, why is there such a lack of so They just see how rent is like going up and like don't have the language to it. And he thinks about land use and other things. Um, I remember um, this, like I worked on um, with college students um, at the Latino Cultural Center. They were doing, there is this program called the Heritage Garden at, um, it's part of the Cultural Centers for Centers for Cultural Understanding and Social Change where students learn about environmental justice and gardening as well. And I taught, helped work with students on why like uh, socialized housing is um, LGBTQ plus um, environmental justice. And um, and it was really amazing with sort of seeing like how like students were so vulnerable and talking about like, I'm doing all this work and yet like I spend so li little time in my house. Like I spend so much in my apartment, and um, and like also like both like learning the tools in terms of like why is there such a lack of affordable housing and like the sort of like mechanicals of like um why they exist, but like also thinking about like how we can reimagine like housing for um around the UIC area and actually like um. A dream like about like what that can look like and so I think that like um in terms of like how we can like um uh make uh urban planning more inclusive of women of color and people of color is like both the language of like what they're experiencing as others on you know amazingly said and also like thinking about how we can like reimagine and like that like your presence in the field would reimagine what a city can be. Okay. Okay. Wow, powerful, powerful responses. Um, I believe that those were all of the uh, questions and I wanna thank the students for asking them. At this point, we have a few more minutes and I would love to open up um, to the audience if there are members here in the space or folks online that would like to ask a question by using the chat feature in Zoom, please feel free to do so. I believe we have space for maybe two or three questions. And uh, panelists, I would encourage you to answer them ad hoc. Don't feel that you have to answer, that all five of you have to answer, answer what you feel comfortable. Thank you very much. I see a question. Okay, so uh, I had a question for Mr. Seal right there. Uh, what's one thing that you took from your studies in journalism that you utilize in your work in urban planning? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Foyas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were foyas. 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 Uh, where you ask for government information um, through, well, now they have online too. To gather information that you need to know about conversations that might be happening politically around a project that you may want to get more details about uh, to make sure it's not harmful. Um, also, I've learned to work with journalism, uh, work with press. Um, they are, press are needed sometimes, the media is needed in our work. Um, in Inglewood in particular, though, it's a very love hate relationship with media. Um, a 
a lot of times I actually don't take interviews. I like to steer what is being discussed because we are the community. I, first of all, I don't know if I should, but I live in England. I'm raising right here. And sometimes we can be the poster child for what's going on with Chicago or even what's going on with So I've had to learn more about the relationship with press. We do our own press releases sometimes. So I use that knowledge to help me, you know, craft the language uh, that we want and to handle how they ask us questions. So sometimes I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to answer that. <laughs> Can I answer that question? Uh, tell you later about a random time where I put them out of my office. So <laughs> but I am so grateful though that I did my undergrad. It was extreme. It's been extreme. Thank you. <laughs> Great question. Yeah. Any other questions? And I know oh, I know some of my students are online too, so maybe they'll have some as well. But um. First of all, thank you, everyone. Um, this was fabulous. Thank you, Keisha, for putting this together. Several people here have been guest speakers in my class and um, just really have shared their impressive work. So I'm curious, partly for the students in the room and online, what's something you're really proud of um, that you've accomplished, uh, that you you know kind of feel like brag a little bit for us, because this is a power panel, uh, and maybe share that. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. When we when we did the campaign for the Bruce Ryman House, the city of Chicago had a plan to put a senior suites apartment building in every ward, and the rents came in. The lowest rent in them at the time was five hundred and ten dollars, which is like over a thousand dollars today. And they were claiming that was affordable housing, and um, we insisted that the rents be at levels that the people who were driving the campaign, most of whom were very low income um, women, you know, who had an income of maybe $800 a month. Um, and so we brought in the, the building and the rent started at $138. Um, so we just very directly challenged the definition of affordability. And we did it using a lot of, you know, definitions and policy tools and just saying, no, that's not, you know, that's not the way to define it. Mm -hmm. I guess what, what I'm proud of in my work all the time, I guess that through evaluation, because data it can be used in such negative ways, um, with community, um, through pandemic, people have been over-surveyed and asked to do lots of things. We, we try to make sure that we're very um, respectful and uh, protective of our community in terms of consent, mm -hmm. in terms of the things that we ask and engage them with, um, representing the true story of the work that's happening on the ground, even if like a funder is defining something a certain way or asking for something, you know, when it's intrusive, standing up for that. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I do advocacy of my work all the time and that's what I love about my work. Um, and proud that at least for, for in Lhasa, we have hands on the ground a lot. And, and as data folks, having access to staff and to community members to really drive work and understand and be a learner in that work, um, I'm really grateful for that. I would say, uh, like, yeah, like helping advise uh, to undergraduate students on the all gender GIS map. Um, in part, it was like a full circle moment because I was like, not too long ago, I was on that other side. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, no, like it was really like great to like help like both like um, kind of help create a space to facilitate their ideas and also like um, also like see how like their stu the students work like made a difference and like and now like um, now like um, people who need to use all gender all gender restrooms is now like it's a, a much more accessible um, a much more accessible map and so yeah I'm really I love what I do <laughs> I have so many proud moments with my team with our partners with the residents I don't sleep ever I don't sleep ever. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, but one proud moment was um, I did a lot of the research work while I was here in 
and it at the time talking about school closure work there was so much propaganda that really created a false narrative of why we were closing schools um it was very very frustrating even emotional but um we helped um to pass two pieces of legislation one requiring that mandated to do a strategic plan that includes the assessments of their buildings the transparency around their capital projects. Um, these are big implications in urban planning. Where schools are built, what's their capacity? When is there a potential closure? Uh, we followed up with the trailer bill in 2018 after the mass school closure. Quick story, mass school closures were not able to happen if they would have actually went with the deadline of our first law. They had to get an extension on our law, law in order to do school closures because that's how preventative, thoughtful, and how much planning work would have had to happen first before that decision was made. The follow-up trailer bill in 2018 was um, inspired after all the high schools were closed in Greater Inglewood. This bill um, uh, requires the district to plan the repurposing of buildings. Because another thing that I was saying is Inglewood's been stuck with all these vacant buildings for mm -hmm. over 10 years. And we've done a lot of work to um, sort of rebuild them. But uh, the, the second trailer bill also requires that when they're doing their planning, which they're in planning session right now, and I got to read, you know, write my angry letter about <laughs> what they're not doing right, um, is to actually work with quality of life plan, work with the Department of Planning, work with the Department of Housing as they're planning for our buildings for the next 10 years. All of that came from me having a better understanding of our planning in the department. And I know my professors were sick of me, but all my papers I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I figured out how I'll take one class and make it about the work that I was doing. <laughs> and it just ended up uh, layering into the larger policy work. I'm really proud of that. Um, I'll just say for me, I've been at the health department for long enough to the 20 years that it feels like it takes to move from an idea into some mm -hmm. kind of sustained and wise mm -hmm. action. Mm -hmm. And so we started looking at childhood exposure to violence. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started the department in 2002, mm -hmm. uh, to now the governor has stood up a task force on Illinois healing, uh, coming to healing, healing center in trauma informed state um, with actual you know, a timeline and white papers, and there's been lots of iteration of that work in the Chicago facing that's complementary to the work of the state. Um, that was at multiple departments and not just, you know, not just people who would live in Austin. Mm -hmm. um, but I think just being able to see the arc of work that you're passionate about to move it into not just kind of language that people say in speeches, but actually starting to see how it drills down into department line items and expectations and performance guidance for grants and so forth. So it's been um, exciting uh, to see that work. I've been able to stay around long enough to see it. It's not over, but to see that it's not just a call for Awesome. Yeah. Um, it's 4.15. I think we have time for one more question. If there's any question online that we want to yeah. ask. Um, so we have a bunch of questions on Zoom. Um, feel bad. I'm sorry, folks, if I don't pick your question. Um, and actually, I'm going to try to paraphrase one of them a little bit. Um, so, you know, we the panel has talked a lot today about um, diversifying the field, like, letting people know the field exists, right? Opening it to more communities. And one of our um, online participants um, was wondering that, you know, if if urban planning is a, is a degree program um, and that access to education can be limited for some, um, how, how do we open the field and actually make it more accessible? Because it is a long degree program, it is expensive, but the nature of what urban planning itself is means that it should be open and accessible to everybody. So kind of how do we, how do we bring more people into urban planning in a way that is actually accessible to everyone and especially to communities that are most affected by the decisions that urban planners, professional urban planners make? That's a great question to, to explore 
had to to wrap up with. I, I think that's a very powerful question. Um, and the, I love the fact that it was asked because it's one of the reasons why I am honored to teach at UIC. Um, I think one of the most powerful things that we can do is explore urban planning concepts and practices with young people, with high schoolers, with non-binary people that are navigating before they even enter college with young people who are facing issues in their community. And I would love to hear what our panelists think. What do we need to really blow the field open and really, really get and engage uh, people around the built environment in ways that resonate uh, 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 a mentor of ours, Dr. Doug Gill, taught me a feminist phrase, the personal is political. How do we get people to see that the personal is political in urban planning is what I hear Ramona asking. What do you all think? I'll, I'll say for me, I am a, a really advocate and a fan for moving credentials to where the people are doing the work mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. making people Mm -hmm. And so things like we have a very, we have a vibrant city college system. Mm -hmm. uh, where is the associate degree, you know, in planning? That's a pathway mm -hmm. into the field. So Absolutely. I'll throw that out as proof. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and we have IBM programs in high school. You know, where are we building that kind of skill set in a high school that's tracked that we're about to the yeah. high rate? Mm -hmm. I would catch the ball for some of our colleagues in organizing, including in Lasse, have been negotiating with silly colleges for the last few months to do a certification program around community work and development. Community health workers. And community yeah. health workers. Yeah. We launched our pilot around community work months ago and just started the this month. Um, I also think inviting folks to be in community engagement spaces around planning. Part of why I like the quality of life plan work in, in Chicago, people get to sit there and help make decisions about things and don't have to be in a certification program or a PS program. They're helping us make the decisions mm -hmm. right now um, for their on how planning is impacting personal life. And it's our job to uphold their engagement. Because there's one thing that I think sometimes that we are taught in urban planning that I always push back against. We're not the experts. Right. Right. Community is the experts. Urban planning is about taking community wisdom and data and helping to put the uh, puzzle together. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we always got to engage community in all the things. That's where my mind was going automatically was about, you know, in, in evaluation and urban planning work, the community being the evaluators, the community being the planners um, is the goal. So how are we engaging them? Um, and I think one other thing I'd add to the, the certification kind of piece is language justice yeah. work as well. So mm -hmm. uh, I know that um, there are rock stars that in Las that have fought for and and got then um, the CHW certification mm -hmm. in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, but thinking about how to engage people where they're at, I think is really important. Money, I'm just gonna say it. Yeah. Yeah. We gotta we gotta provide more scholarships, more money. Mm -hmm. um, the Pathways program, we've done that and along with mentorship and recognizing the accidental, what we call, I, I like that, <laughs> or emerging evaluators, same with urban planners, like you can have a career path and then decide to go into urban planning, you know, and that, and encouraging that, right? Um, I, I like starting at youth, but also when you're in the field, the best at urban planners are those that have worked in communities for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would say um, it's important that as planners are being trained, that they really be challenged not to be the experts mm -hmm. and not to be technocrats. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the, the technocratic term in organizing is really disturbing. Um, solutions that are so complex, programs that are so complex that people can't navigate them. Mm -hmm. So really... Um, pushing students, people who are who are already on a career path of organizing, to recognize that they're they are they are a tool for communities. They are not there to remake communities. They are there 
to help communities figure out how to remake themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, now like kind of echoing what y'all have mentioned, I do think like, yeah, like I really like the idea of like bringing the program to where communities are at because they are doing like, they are doing the work and they are um, they may not necessarily have the right like quote unquote language, but they know what's happening in their yeah. communities and they know what's um, they know how to help alleviate the problems when given the tools. And yeah, like I also agree like with money, like making sure not just like the curriculum and like um, is accessible, but also financially accessible, like scholarships, even tuition waivers, even as well, like mm -hmm. because. Um, and so, yeah, and that's, um, yeah. And yeah, I think that, um, yeah, like also like, yeah, like envisioning that like both like in terms of like bringing the sort of, uh, urban thing to the community and like thinking to kind of echo, like to think about like reimagining, not just thinking about like the harm that urban planning has done, um, they already know, they already know, they already know that, but like also thinking about how to like reimagine their communities. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Great conversation. Alisa, Jasmine, Shaquille, and Marlita, I truly appreciate your time this afternoon and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.